Greetings from Berlin and welcome from the city's Jewish Museum. My name is Karen Helmstedt. 1,700 years since the first documented evidence of Jewish life in Germany. It's an anniversary and a chance to celebrate Jewish culture, history, and everyday life. And that's what we'd like to talk about. Tonight, in our discussion, the third generation on the move, we'll hear from younger Jews about what makes them tick. How do they experience Judaism and Jewish identity here in Europe? And how are they pushing to break with stereotypes and write their own narratives? These are just some of the questions that we hope to ask this evening. And these are my guests. Dimitri Kapitelman is to my left, and he's a writer, journalist, and so-called Jewish quota refugee from Ukraine. He's the author of two books that draw from that experience, recently became a German citizen, and says he shares responsibility for the country as such, along with his family and friends, their collective foes, and whether he likes it or not. A warm welcome. Shai Terry is an Israeli-born mezzo-soprano. She came to Germany in 2018 and is currently doing a master's in voice at the university uh, at the Mainz School of Music. She says living in Germany has made her more conscious of her Jewish heritage and more observant of her traditions. Welcome. Deborah Feldman is a writer whose best-selling memoirs, Unorthodox and Exodus, recount her escape from the ultra-Orthodox uh, Satmar community in Williamsburg, New York. She now lives here in Berlin and has a German passport and says, I'm German and I refuse to be introduced as anything else. Welcome to you, Deborah. Hetty Berg over here on my right hails from the Netherlands and has over three decades of experience in culture management. Last year, she took over as the director of the Jewish Museum here in Berlin, so she's effectively actually the real host, and says that she only gives a platform to voices that reject violence and exclusion and approach others with respect. And finally, also in our audience today is Levi Israel Ufafilge. He's the author of Nicht ohne meine Kippa, which translates as Not Without My Kippa, and he's here to uh, speak to us and bring in the perspective of a third generation religious conservative. Thanks very much to all of you for joining us. Now, it's very interesting. All of our panelists on stage here are born outside of Germany, all came to Germany for very different reasons. You're all working in creative uh, capacities and yet all have very, very different perspectives on uh, Jewish life in this country. Shai Terry, I'm wondering, I just spoke about the third generation on the move. Do you see it that way? Is that an accurate description? I think so. I think the, for me as third generation here to live in Germany was something that I actually dream about all of my life. Because uh, my grandparents were living in Frankfurt for almost 20 years. So I basically grew up with traveling to Germany and coming back to Israel. And my very first um, baby step were actually here in Frankfurt. And. Um, and for me to come to Germany was something that I wanted to do. And now I'm feeling that this is also my delegation. Mm -hmm. And as ambassador, um, I think this is something that we, as the young generation, as this third generation for Holocaust survivors, this is something that we want to accomplish here with our lives, being Israeli, being Jewish, being also a woman. and. Um, yeah, this is something I'm very proud of, and I think that we should keep doing that. Thank you, and we're very glad that you're, that you're here with us this evening. Dimitri Kapitelman, you were eight years old when you came to Germany uh, from the Ukraine. How much of a shake-up are you seeing amongst the young Jews of your generation? I do sense a strong self-confidence mm -hmm. among the younger generation, and this is something I really enjoy. From what I hear from from Jewish people I know and who I perform in front of and read to, there's strong will and a strong uh, sense of urgency mm -hmm. to do so. Another writer here on the stage, but with a very different story, Deborah Feldman, your path has consistently been one of rebellion uh, as a Jewish woman, as a feminist. How strong is your sense of community with your cohorts here in Germany that you're not alone in this quest for self-determination? Very strong. I would say it's the first place where I felt any sense of real community as opposed mm -hmm. to like 
imposed or performed community. Um, I am continually bowled over and deeply gratified by the diverse experiences and perspectives on Jewish life that I've encountered in Berlin. There are many things that I experienced here for the first time. For example, the fact that so many young Jewish people who only have patrilineal Jewish heritage and are therefore not considered to be, you know, 100% Jewish. Traditionally Jewish. Exactly. The fact that here they um, fight for recognition and for acceptance. That's something that I was only introduced to here. It wasn't an issue I was faced with before. And I think that's just one of many examples of young people basically announcing that they are prepared to completely change the meaning of what Jewish is and that very little can get in their way. Thank you very much. Hetty Berg, uh, we've just heard this. Is this a kind of a modern expression of, of young Judaism uh, in Berlin after just over a year here? How are you perceiving the discourse, the ideas, the activities of the young generation uh, in Germany? Well, it was certainly one of the things that attracted me to come to Berlin and to lead this uh, wonderful house, uh, that there are so many people here, uh, the young generation, maybe also already the generation before, that are really uh, very consciously trying to define for themselves what it means to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, so all these many voices, all these different perspectives is also something that we, uh, that we show here in the Jewish Museum Berlin, which I think is also very important to show because most people have, um, yeah, don't have such a um, nuanced idea about what Jews are. So this whole dynamic way of, of mm -hmm. Jewish life, I think that is one of the, yeah, one of the very interesting things here in Germany, Berlin especially, and great to show here in the museum. Thank you very much, per particularly here in Berlin. And you mentioned many voices. We'd like to hear some other voices. And so we spoke to two young filmmakers who were making waves at the recent Jewish Film Festival. In Berlin, two filmmakers who represent the Jewish younger generation in Germany meet to exchange ideas. Sharon Rubakan and Arkady Chayet. They're both here visiting the renowned Jewish film festival Berlin Brandenburg. Chayet helped put together this year's program. The lineup shows how young Jewish men and women see themselves and how they want to be seen. Ich bin Dima. Take Chayet's award-winning film, Mazel Tov Cocktail. Wildly funny, yet rousing, reckoning with stereotypes. Ich bin Jude. Richtiger, lebendiger Jude. When you say you're Jewish in Germany and out yourself as a Jew, it's like the world around you turns black and white. People can only think of the Holocaust. In Germany, when folks talk about Jewish life, they're talking about dead Jewish life, not about life. But at some point, enough's enough. Dima isn't one of those conciliatory characters. And of course, it's also a privilege for him to be aggressive and angry. That's something Dima's parents likely couldn't have afforded to be when they came to Germany. There's a new generation of Jews who are confident, who want to shape the conversation. They don't want to be forced into these old roles. And Sharon Rubakan is one of them. The Franco-Israeli director was born in Germany and returned in 2007. Her documentary, Displaced, is an attempt to clarify her relationship to her birthplace and process her family's history to break their silence about the Holocaust. Man hat so Vermutungen, wer involviert war. Man hat halt einfach nicht drüber gesprochen. Und dann weißt du, okay, da irgendwas ist das, was du findest, wenn du suchst, wird dich nicht freuen. Ich glaube, dass die zweite The second generation really grew up with the Shoah. Ich war durch die Mutter mich but the third generation is in a very different situation. The Holocaust is further in the past, but having that distance is difficult. Even though I was born in Germany, 
I often feel the need to forget where I am in order to feel free. Natürlich haben kollektive of course, collective traumas still have an influence. And of course, that impacts us. And yet, we live here. We have German friends and good times, and some bad times too. But we're here. There's a new self-confidence. We want to have a voice. Sharon Rubakan and Arkady Chayet, just two of many who view Jewish life differently who are redefining it and making it their mark. Shai Terry, is there still too much focus on the past, on the ugly things, the Holocaust, um, when we're talking about Jews in Germany? What do you encounter? For me, I think that um, we are, as the young generation, we don't concentrate a lot on the past, mm -hmm. especially among the musicians. Like, this is the um, surroundings and the colleagues that I have, like, mostly. And um, I really think that when we are coming to this point that we are talking about this topic, it's the atmosphere is getting uh, completely different. Mm -hmm. Then everybody is getting more serious. Everybody is getting more into their thoughts and um, and I think that most of my friends here are actually non-Jewish. And the history that we're trying somehow to live in the past and really to mm -hmm. live the present as it is, and that is so beautiful and so great as we are all friends and trying to live really with great harmony. Deborah Feldman, how is it for you? I'd, I'd like to see how you perceive Jewish life in Germany compared to what you know in America. And I'm wondering to what extent is Jewish identity um, some, something that is sometimes decided for you? Well, I will say that my experiences in American society um, ranged from absolute disinterest to rejection. I felt like there was no room for my identity that America was requiring me to be absorbed into the melt melting pot and nobody wanted to know about where I came from. And it was one of the reasons why I think I felt so strongly driven to, to write my story because I, was, I wanted to be heard, I wanted to be understood. I wanted to be able to say to people, oh, I grew up Hasidic in Brooklyn and I wanted that to mean something, that people would be able to recognize what that meant and know who I was as a result. And when I came to Germany, I think I was, I was quite surprised by the intense and passionate interest that was shown me from all segments of society, and even the ones I think we wouldn't expect it from. I mean, I, I think I met uh, Palestinians for the first time in Berlin, mm -hmm. and I was taught to be so afraid of that encounter, and these encounters turned out to be incredibly human and peaceful because we were alone with each other, and it wasn't the entire world staring at us and projecting their politics onto us. Um, and so I feel like Berlin is a safe space for people to to connect with each other on an individual level. And I feel like on, you know, on the basis of these individual relationships, there's so much you can build. Mm -hmm. But like Shai, you know, I find that many of my friends are not of Jewish background. Of course, I have, um, I have friendships mm -hmm. with, with Jewish people, but certainly the friendships I have with Jewish people are what I would call you know, unconventional. And these are unconventional Jews. Dimitri Kapitelman, you're nodding. <laughs> I'm going to continue to nod. I'm just thinking as a Jew from the former Soviet Union, the Dima that we saw in the film um, has similarities to some degree with the Dima from your latest novel. So let's learn a little bit more about your story. Dimitri Kapitelman. Born in Kiev, his family moved to Germany in 1994. He writes about people caught between two worlds. What exactly it means for my non-religious father to be a Jew remains indiscernible to me to this day. In his family, Judaism was barely visible, yet omnipresent. His books are laced with his own special brand of humor, funny, yet sad too. And I've written a second book. It has cats. It has corruption. It has cats. Did I say that already? And it's about my mother. Yes, it's about her too. His novels are a declaration of love to his parents. Dimitri Kapitelman has managed to do what they couldn't, feel at home in Germany. My parents were on their way to Israel. They had their stuff shipped already. Then they had a change of heart. And one day I asked my father, 
like 20, 20 years later maybe, uh, why? Why Germany of all places? Because obviously you're not trusting this place, you're not trusting this country. There is no building on an individual level, not, not from, from what you give out, not what you get. And he told me, because of you. Because since your mother is not Jewish, you would have always have been a second class Jewish citizen there. Um, and that's quite a burden. It's one thing to know that you somehow shape the destiny of your mm -hmm. parents, your family that much. Mm -hmm. And then also in this particular case that your parents probably would have done way better there. And still, you know, I wasn't really involved in, in becoming a child. Exactly, you were busy. Right. <laughs> I had better stuff to do. <laughs> um, so this in itself is so sad that it's funny again. Is that still true in, or is that true in Israel that someone with a Jewish father and not the Jewish mother would be considered a second class citizen? Yes. Is this modern view of things um, changing there? Or not? No, not no. at all. It is absolutely like this, and this is something that I'm very not proud of, and for me, it makes me very, very disappointed and not proud of it. It's I don't know how to call it even. Could I, could I, could yes, I absolutely, two, I want you to. Two things. I, yes. I, I'll keep it brief. First of all, when I'm in Israel, I'm not even second class Jewish, I'm just Russian. And um, the second thing, since I mentioned it about being Jewish from the fatherly side, I suffered from it deeply. Uh, I had complexes. I thought this is, this is a general failure of me. But these days, I think this is a gift. This is God's way of keeping me away from dogmatism. Mm -hmm. God's way. Yeah. <laughs> because until now, I had no idea you were like, religious. I'm making you a Jew but I make it especially <laughs> tough for you to be one. <laughs> you grew up in the state of Saxony and arriving there in the 90s, you were immediately subject to anti-Semitic threats, attacks, harassment. Uh, what goes through your mind when you see the anti-Semitic anti attacks on the rise in Germany today? Well, I'm depressed. I see how we're not evolving as, as human beings and as society. We're not. It's still monkey brain. When I see this, we are evolving, obviously, but not all of us at the same pace. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, because of the upward trend in anti-Semitic crimes in Germany, the Berlin-based rapper Ben Salomo says that this anniversary that we're actually using as the hook for this talk here this evening, this anniversary year, is no cause at all for celebration. And his song, De Dushka, which means grandfather, expresses just how torn uh, he feels living here. Unzählige Generationen, Millionen meiner Ahnen haben schon hier gewohnt. Doch dieses Land hat sie nicht verschont. Israeli-born rapper Ben Salomo says out loud what many Jews in Germany are thinking. But anti-Semitism is still being downplayed. Even if politicians have begun to react and provide means to address the problem, some feel that's not enough. The anger and impatience is completely justified and understandable, because for years, actually decades, Germany slept through the fight against anti-Semitism. They closed their eyes to it and only woke up a few years back. Studies show anti-Semitism is deeply rooted in about 15 to 20 percent of the German population, and it's taking new forms. At protests against corona measures, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are being spread and the Holocaust is being trivialized. And at anti-Israel demonstrations, Jews have been subject to pure hate, like here in Gelsenkirchen. That's the really fundamental change in the recent past. Those with anti-Semitic views are more willing to articulate them in public and are increasingly prepared to resort to violence. In Germany, Jewish life is increasingly under threat. The numbers prove it. In 2020, anti-Semitic hate crimes rose by almost 16% compared to the year before. 
And that feeling of being threatened weighs heavily on Jews, says Marina Chervinsky, founder of OFEC, a counseling center for anti-Semitic violence and discrimination in Germany. That doesn't automatically mean every person has had direct personal experiences, but there's a considered caution or a lasting sense of potential danger. A danger that can also turn into terror, like during the attack on the synagogue in Halle in 2019. Two people were killed, though this door saved the lives of many more. Talia Feldman was in the synagogue that day. An American who lives in Hamburg, she dealt with the trauma through her art. She's collected data and audio from racist acts of violence during the last 40 years. Recognizing that behind that data are people and our hearts. Das Maß der Bedrohung, die heute von rechtem Terror ausgeht, haben zuletzt der Mord an Walter Lübeck. Feldman's sound installation reveals the structures behind right-wing terror in Germany. Her work is about remembering and mourning, about hearing and listening. But above all, it asks. If we can't recognize the continuities, how are we going to stop them from happening in the future? How are we going to stop this from happening? Some very sobering lyrics also from Ben Salomo, uh, a fellow Israeli, and that song was dedicated to the victims of anti-Semitic and racist attacks uh, here in Germany, in Halle, and in Hanau Scheiteri. Um, you have some thoughts, I think, after this piece. Yeah, my very last concert before Corona was uh, in the synagogue in Mainz. And it was 2019, and it was really a um, few months after the attack in Halle. Mm -hmm. And um, usually we have always the police that are guarding um, the synagogue, but there there were much more because of this concert from the Jewish community. And because they knew that there are going to be a lot of people in this concert. And that was the very first time for me that I felt insecure before I went on stage to sing. You felt afraid? I felt really afraid. For Don't me as an artist, as this feeling, it was something that I never experienced and I, re I really wish that I would never experience again. Never experience it again. Hetty Berg, um, obviously the officers and the, the constant security are no, are no um, unusual thing for you working here in the Jewish Museum. Germany's culture of remembrance, diese Erinnerungskultur, as they call it here, with regard to the crimes of, of uh, Nazi Germany, has been widely admired in the past and, and admired um, internationally as well. Why is it failing to grasp the actual, the really present reality uh, for Jews today and, and, and failing to protect them? I think it's not only um, a problem that is in, in Germany, it's also uh, something that's very hard to uh, to define exactly. This is also something that we try to uh, to present to to the people that come here in the museum. That it's it's uh, it's hard to define what is anti-Semitism exactly. Where does it start? What where can you begin? do uh, against it? It's, um, in in the Netherlands, uh, also every synagogue is being. Uh, um, guarded their security. I mean, I'm, I'm totally used to that. Uh, I'm afraid. I think it will always be there in a way, and it will. It's not just in this group or in that group. It's in the middle of society. It has. Uh, it takes different forms, and the only thing you can do is is to yeah to try to make people aware of this stereotyping and at a very early age. And I don't think it's like, okay, Germany did a really good job, so how is it possible? This anti-Semitism has always been there after the war, straight after the war. So it's not something like, oh, this is suddenly happening again. And I think that's also important to, to realize. And yet there is a rise that, that, that you have noticed as well, uh, Dimitri Kapitelman. I'm going to go over here because, as I mentioned, Levi uh, Israel Ufafilge is following here from the audience, and I have to come down, and because of corona, I have to stand one and a half meters away from you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Mr. Offerfeger, born 1988 in West Germany, and you're a student of rabbinical studies and author of the book, as I mentioned earlier, Nicht ohne meine Kippa, Not Without My Kippa. Now, the kippa, which you're wearing here today, is obviously a very important symbol of belonging for you, and yet, as we've seen with recent attacks just this summer, even it very clearly makes you a target. Standing up uh, and making sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen, but what are your, what's your response uh, to the, to the rising anti-Semitism in Germany at the moment? Well, my response is um, not to back down. As you mm. mentioned, mm. the kippah is my symbol of Jewish expression. is very dear to me. And, I, um, and I'm quite stubborn in uh, being visible. I really um, like and love my Jewish identity. And um, I am ready to... Um, bear the consequences that mm. might happen um, to me. But I must say I was very lucky, really just lucky in the past years um, that nothing worse than um, some bruises happened to me. Mm. Um, I find it to be very, very important to um, keep on being visible in this country because I think um, that just being private and being invisible just does more harm than good to us. As a teacher and a religious leader, you were just recently uh, at the Jewish uh, International School, you're educating, so to speak, the fourth generation mm -hmm. of, of Jews. Uh, how do you prepare them for this kind of, of everyday onslaught, for, for, this, this, uh, the, for how they have to sort of comport themselves in the world? Well, I guess as all Jewish educators do these days, um, we try to um, do everything to, to give our students and to help them um, develop on their own a good um, Jewish identity mm -hmm. and self-expression and mm -hmm. a good Jewish self-worth. Um, we can't save them uh, from everything that is going on, but we can give them the tools to react to it and to be resilient and um, the means of um, how to be careful when you're visible. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to be too adventurous um, um, and you also need to get a sense of where you're secure or where it's too dangerous to mm -hmm. be visible or outspoken um, and you also need the, the right tools to get other people's attention if necessary. You're studying to be a rabbi at the new center of Jewish theology in Potsdam, and that brings together a liberal, both liberal and conservative theologies. I'm just wondering how helpful will this be to have Judaism more firmly anchored and perhaps recognized in, in Germany, uh, as recognized as the Christian religion. Oh, hopefully it will and do. And other religions. Hopefully it will do a lot. I mean, rabbis are very good multiplicators mm -hmm. um, if we let them be. Um, <laughs> and if we have some rabbis who are um, also well versed and, um, uh, and well educated, um, I think we have a great responsibility mm -hmm. in our non Jewish environment, especially as rabbis or soon to be, hopefully, rabbis, um, to, to engage in every kind of inter religious and intercultural concept. I think it's key um, to get to know each other. Thank you very much, Levi Israel Ufafilge, for those Thank insights. You. Mr. Fulfilga spoke about visibility and uh, not backing down. Deborah Feldman, you fled a very visible, um, ultra-religious community, did really the unthinkable from the point of view of your family and your community, chose to move to Germany, um, Berlin, earn your own money, uh, do all of these things that were not, were not acceptable. Any misgivings for having, with, with the situation at the moment that, that how do you feel you can contribute to um, what Hetty Berg was talking about in terms of broadening, uh, broadening perspectives and, and not allowing this anti-Semitic uh, 
like wave to take over. It is important to me to show people that Judaism is not a monolith and that even within monolithic communities, there is a lot of dissent and a lot of diversity. And I'll be honest and say that before people like me, I don't want to say just before me, but, but my generation has a much higher number of ex-Orthodox people than have previously um, existed in the Jewish world. And I think before we showed up um, and we made a fuss, people didn't really wrestle with the idea of orthodoxy within the Jewish world. And Jews didn't wrestle with it and non-Jews didn't either. And it is not just of social importance, but of political importance because in, in the day and age we live in, religion has a dramatic impact on politics and therefore on our society, you know, on a global scale. Um, and we see it uh, happening and it is only going to get worse. And so what I want to contribute is essentially the other side of the coin. Um, it's, uh, you know, the dangers of retreating too far into identity, the dangers of forgetting our common humanness. Do you ever feel fear in Berlin? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I feel, I'll be honest, uh, on this count as well, I have felt unsafe in my life, but mostly as a woman and not mm -hmm. as a Jewish person. Um, and sometimes in Berlin, I also feel unsafe as a woman. Um, I have witnessed many anti-Semitic incidents, but I have witnessed many of them outside of Germany. What I appreciate very much about this country is the fact that it is a central topic of discussion. We talk mm -hmm. about anti-Semitism, we talk about what causes it, where it comes from, how we can prevent it from happening, how we can address it once it's happened. Um, we keep it visible in the public sphere. It is a cultural priority in this country. Yeah. That is unique. That is not common across the board in my experience. Berlin, obviously uh, a place where you feel safe, it provided very much a safe space for you to continue writing your story and Deborah Feldman's story, of course, is one that many people will be familiar with. Let's look a bit more closely. Deborah Feldman was born in New York. She came to Berlin in 2014 after fleeing from the subjugation she experienced in her ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. In her best-selling memoir, Unorthodox, and in a film, she tells her story. I was to have intercourse with someone I didn't know whether I wanted to or not. So I had sex. It was extremely painful. I cried. And the following week, I found out I was pregnant. Deborah Feldman has settled in, of all places, a country reviled by her Hasidic Jewish community. Where I come from. In 2020, her book was adapted into an Emmy Award-winning miniseries. Unorthodox, a glimpse into a little-known world, a literary survival story, and a blow for freedom. Freedom and, and liberation. You've uh, said, I read a quote of yours, that you said the German identity is linked to guilt, shame, the struggle with the past, and these residual traumas. People, many people might wonder how that um, can be liberating. Well, I guess maybe it's just liberating for me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe because I come from a culture so deeply influenced by survivor's guilt mm -hmm. and um, by the inability to recover from trauma. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was only like that for me personally that I came here and I realized, well, everybody's like that here. <laughs> I'm just one of millions. <laughs> and I felt, I felt inordinately relieved. Like I finally wasn't alone with this feeling that people understood what it was like to live like that. And even if it was from a different perspective, it's. We're all haunted in the end in the same way because this generation, it's not about who our grandparents were, it's about who we are now and what world we want to build. Language is a very big part of your new identity and you're actually even writing your first novel in German. Um, how does that feel? Really good. Um, 
I'm, so I'm struggling actually even um, these days to, to write in English because I feel so emotionally alienated from English. It was never my language. I had to learn it to get by. You grew up speaking only, Yiddish? Exactly. It was the only language um, available to me if I wanted to get out and live another life. And so I, I took it on, right? I made mm -hmm. it my own, but it was never my home. Shai Terry, your thoughts on, on, on delving into your new German identity and being here, embracing this country? Yeah, so as you said, I moved here almost three years ago and um, I decided to learn German as fast as I can and um, um, to, to be more like integrated with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, but also I, was, I, I found it really, really interesting that um, all the people that I met here was uh, related to me as I'm Shai Terry that came from Israel and as more as an Israeli, as, as a Jewish girl. And for me, it was very, very interesting to see how the people are reacting to these two different things, to be Israeli and to be Jewish. And I was also very, very grateful to have um, great people around me that wanted to know my religion, my tradition, and my culture, and was asking me so many things about it, and people mm -hmm. wanted to learn some new words in Hebrew, and um, wanted to come to my home to celebrate Shabbat with me. And uh, as a Jewish Israeli, you're one of many young Israelis who have uh, chosen to leave Israel and move to Germany. Let's hear a bit more about Shai Terry. Shai Terry. Born in northern Israel, she studied classical music in Tel Aviv. Soon after, she began performing at official events in Israel and toured the US. She sang for the Israeli military, serving as a soldier for two years. <laughs> Along with classical music, she also sings Hebrew songs. That's important to her. But it's not just with her singing that Shai Terry transcends boundaries. Since 2018, she's been living in Germany, making a dream come true. For now, she plans to stay in her new homeland. You study classical music, but as we saw there, you also have a passion for Hebrew songs. Um, you work a lot together with the pianist Adi Bar. What kind of resonance do you get from, uh, from your audiences, from German audiences, but also from the Jewish communities here to, that you sing to? Um, so I can sing a whole concert in five different languages, and then my very last encore will be some very little song in Hebrew, and the people will be remembering only that, <laughs> even though I made some crazy <laughs> arias and pirouettes with my voice, but they say that they remembering only this one. So it's this nice. This idea <laughs> of feeling at home, we're, we're going to come back to that. I'd like to come over to Hetty Berg because you've also got a very, a very European perspective uh, here coming from the Netherlands. Um, you're someone who has always asked questions, as you say, asked many questions as the second generation, uh, the second generation here on our panel and sought to understand the bigger picture of Jewish heritage. Hetty Bag, at the opening of the Jewish Museum's Berlin's new core exhibition a year ago. Born in The Hague, Bag is an active member of the liberal Jewish community. She's studied dance, art, theater studies, and management. Her talent for bringing people together is something that's urgently needed in Berlin, at the Jewish Museum in particular. Since childhood, Hetty Berg has regularly visited her family in Israel. Tradition means a lot to her. Her advice to young visitors to the Jewish Museum? Be open to other opinions. And, above all, learn to think for yourself. How easy is it to encourage people to think for themselves with some of these big issues that you have to present here? I think what, what you can strive for is that when people come into 
this museum, they come with certain notions about what it is to be Jewish, uh, what Jewish, uh, what Jewish means, um, and uh, also for Jews themselves, that can also be like that. A learning uh, experience. That you know, there that you show different perspectives, and that at least you put something next to that what they already thought. And maybe that will move something in them, move in their, in their thinking, in their opinion, or maybe in their feeling. Definitely, and, and, and a huge gift for the city. The Jewish Museum has been a welcoming space for learning and dialogue, and that, in fact, for exactly 20 years. It hit Berlin like a bolt of lightning back in 2001. From above, the Jewish Museum Berlin resembles a shattered Star of David a building that attracts attention and leaves plenty of room for interpretation. 20 years ago, the museum's opening was marked with a state ceremony. It was a sign of change. German Jewish history would no longer only be told in the context of the Shoah. The museum would present Jewish life in Germany through the centuries. Polish-born Israeli-American architect Daniel Liebeskind managed to create a space that integrates the historical with the contemporary. The building's voids create a sense of openness while simultaneously pointing out what is missing, the victims of the Holocaust. It is architecture in service of the past and the present. Europe's largest Jewish museum presents 1,700 years of German Jewish history in a playful, interactive way. The new permanent exhibition, which director Hedy Berg opened last year, also focuses on aspects of daily Jewish life. What is kosher food? What happens on the Sabbath? But space is also devoted to the dark side of Jewish history, a history of exclusion and expulsion, impressively documented in hundreds of laws. Discrimination and anti-Semitism existed long before the Shoah. Alongside its core exhibition, the museum mounts changing exhibits on sometimes controversial topics, like the uneasy cohabitation between Jews, Christians, and Palestinians in Jerusalem. And there are shows on contemporary Jewish art. Currently, one is devoted to Israeli Yael Bartana, who uses images to question historical narratives about Jewish history. The museum is not averse to provocation. I think the museum is alive. As, as you walk through it, as you see the exhibitions, contemporary exhibitions, new installation, I think it's fantastic. I think that's the idea of a museum. A museum is a dynamic institution. It's not just a static you know, box with something inside of it. It reflects changing realities. One of these is right across the street the newly opened Children's Museum, Anoha. This Noah's Ark is open to all children, regardless of religion and culture. The Jewish Museum Berlin, a meeting place for all generations. Your plans for the future, do you see yourself actually staying in, in Germany? Uh, much of your family, uh, your grandparents actually went back to Israel. Will you, will you be staying here? I didn't know what Germany has to, for me to offer from studies, from job, from um, experience. But I also uh, met the love of my life here and we got engaged a few months ago. So um, I guess I will be staying here for a little bit more. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, but in general, I feel like, um, as we all speaking about home, I feel um, home is where you feel your best version of yourself. Yeah. And home is where the people you love are surrounding you. Mm -hmm. So I have my home, of course, in Israel with all of my family and all of my friends, but I created my very own home here. Dimitri Kapitelman, you traveled to Israel with your father to better understand your Jewish identity. Uh, Ukraine was your lost homeland. Germany was your not really yet homeland. Did it help going to Israel? Well, Is it, it a Sehnsuchtsort? It a helped place of cure me of this idea. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and it uh, surely helped me to uh, grow as a person. Mm -hmm. 
and as a writer, but this home thing, I don't know. So it's not, it's not an, an option for you? Um, it's, it's just not in the cards, but that's okay. I, I have different cards. It took you many years to uh, take on German citizenship. Now yeah. you have the nationality. Is, can, can Germany still become a homeland for you? Going back to what Deborah said, um, we, we are f trying to figure out now who we are, and I am as well. Of course I am. H however, and it's, it is still related to the past because the chains, the links are broken at some point. It's hard to find that. It's hard to, to, to reconnect who you are if you don't know where you came from. So with that being said and keeping your question in mind, Yes, I feel at home as a German, Jewish, Russian writer. That's, that's what I have to offer. But, 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 but here's the thing. This is, this is how we often perceive that this unclear belonging is minus. I did myself, but it's not. It's an enrichment, and we should stop demanding mm -hmm. things to fit that almost automatically. They're not. They can't. Deborah yeah. Feldman, um, because you've adopted the German language, we use the word in German, obviously, Heimat, uh, for homeland, this feeling of homeland. I, I think I read somewhere uh, that you said it was possible to never arrive. Is a feeling of Heimat or homeland, is it, is it necessary? Can Germany fit that bill for you one day? I, I, think, I think what I said was it's possible to be at home in the experience of not having a home like to just maybe get really, really accustomed to it and feel comfortable there. Mm -hmm. um, for many people, that's the only option. Um, I have, you know, I've gotten into arguments with, with you know, conservative-leaning thinkers, you know, who are in my generation, my age group, who, who argue that Heimat is extremely important, that it's what Germans say, identitätsstiftend, right? It builds identity without Heimat, without home, we don't have identity. And, you know, I would say, yes, I'm sure it's important for some identities. Um, I, but I think there are still um, identities that do not require a fixed sense of home the way that Heimat connotates. And, um, however, what we really say, you know, that's my opinion, when we say Heimat is, um, a sense of social rootedness, right? A sense of social connection and belonging. And Berlin has always been both famous and notorious for offering this to people um, immediately without making them work for it and um, just as easily and quickly letting them go if they want to do so. So um, in that sense, um, certainly I have um, set down roots in the very thin, sandy soil of Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> as, as have many of us. <laughs> and uh, sandy soils, yes, definitely uh, scraping underground, but uh, always uh, feels good when you fall. It's not as hard as, as certain surfaces. Thank you very much to all of my guests. It is time to wrap up. We're obviously looking at an incredible diversity of experience of Jewish life uh, on this stage. It is going forward. And dealing with issues of the past and constantly grappling and actively shaping new conversations. Let's make sure we keep listening to them. Thanks to all my guests and thanks very much to our audience. And uh, until we meet again, all the best and with some nice and